All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the podcast that explores the Heartlands Entertainment Industries. Today is going to be a little different. Uh, first of all, we are live streaming for the first time. It's not something that we normally do. Also, this is totally and completely live uh, on a Tuesday, which is also not something we normally do. And the third thing is that we're not necessarily talking about the film industry specifically. We're talking about uh, an event that was that is based in Oklahoma that has now gone kind of global as far as you know a freaking phenomenon. We are of course talking about Tiger King. Um, so today I'm talking to my criminal behavior uh, specialist friend, Sarah Kalen, <laughs> who, uh, for those of you who listen to the podcast, you may remember Sarah from her episode, uh, our, our true crime episode, where we really went into the nitty gritty of the Hell in the Heartland case that Sarah and I worked together on back in 2018. Fun little detail about that is that uh, that's where we met, Sarah and I, and then I was talking about working on this weird documentary with this weird guy <laughs> and Sarah it just kind of piqued your interest didn't it yeah it absolutely did well I had seen at that point the um the John Oliver story I think already um and so I was like just ever so slightly familiar with this character that you had down there so when you said you had worked on a doc about it I was like oh my god I really <laughs> want to hear everything so yeah and so I want to pre preface this uh, discussion by just letting you guys know that I can't necessarily talk about a whole lot of behind the scenes details of the documentary itself because I've been having that kind of annoying conversation back and forth with Netflix, which Sarah, I'm sure you can relate of, I can't talk about stuff just yet. <laughs> so I can allude to things um, and I can, I can, I think I can, I think it's okay to say that I can talk about my experience with Joe because my experiences with Joe were not just from the documentary, like I'd met him previously. Um, and I can also kind of confirm and deny stuff, <laughs> I guess. So we'll, we're, we're just gonna kind of play this by ear because again, we've never live streamed like this before. Um, thank you guys, everybody who is tuning in right now. And uh, yeah, so, um, Sarah, for, for those that are just tuning in right now, can you kind of uh, reiterate your professional background? Like beyond, or did we, we just did that, didn't we? We did, yeah. Um, yeah, the basic, the very short story. I was a cop for a long time and then I became a researcher and now I am a cold case homicide investigator. Um, and documentary producer. So there, that's the short story. Freaking sweet. <laughs> okay, so uh, what are your first impressions? Now you watched Tiger King all the way through. Yeah, twice now. I've watched it start to finish twice now. Bless I mean, I figured if I was gonna talk about it, I would, I would watch it through this lens of being prepared to talk about it. Um, I am nothing if not a dedicated nerd. So, um, the, I mean, I guess the first thing I want to say is, and I, everybody has heard this a million times. If you watch news, you know, news stories about, um, about criminals where there might be an element of psychology discussed. And that caveat is that everything that we're saying is speculation. Um, I can't give any sort of an official classification on anything, obviously. I mean, one, I wouldn't be in a position to. And two, um, documentary, no matter how well it's done, can present a distorted view. And and so, I mean, while I think this was a really well done doc, I did not mind watching it twice. Um, it's important to, you know, to say that everything that we're going to talk about today or any speculations I might have are based purely on what's available through the documentary. So I wouldn't want um, to, to disparage anybody in any way um, more than what I would imagine they might deserve, depending on who we're talking about, um, <laughs> you know, without saying that, that there's always a possibility that these characterizations are not completely correct. Yeah. Well, and that's, it, it's really interesting, uh, seen what all they left out because it's one thing i can say ah, i'll be curious about that yeah the documentary project 
Now, keep in mind that I was only the sound guy on the Oklahoma unit. I was the main sound guy, and there were there were several other guys that would day play, but I was kind of their main guy. Um, so I wasn't on the Carol Baskin stuff, and I wasn't on the Doc Antle stuff. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's just very yeah. We're gonna talk about Doc Antle a lot. Yeah. Ooh, I'm really curious what you have to say. <laughs> I, don't, I don't. I don't care for him. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's start with Joe. Um, yeah. You know, as you're watching this seven episode series, what were your initial thoughts on Joe Exotic? So my initial thoughts are that there there is a lot of evidence of narcissism, right? So there's a lot of projection of ego. Um, you know, everything out of his mouth is everyone wants to be like me when they and he lists off these things that he he says, you know, oh, look, they see I live with like a hundred big cats and they want to be like me, and it's like who wants to be like you? Like <laughs> yeah. nobody, right? But that, but narcissism will allow people this sort of like self-aggrandizement that that makes them project their own value, their own self-worth that they that is sometimes a balance of very low self-worth and very very high self-esteem. Um, mm-hmm. They kind of project that out onto the world, and they just like they're just like holding up a mirror the other way, and everything's bouncing back at them, and they're like, oh yeah, everybody wants to be like me. And he just, I mean, there was a lot of that. Um, I, <laughs> I, I did think in his defense that um, when he was discussing how his family responded to him coming out of the closet yeah. as a very young man during very formative years, it's really difficult to understate the importance of that. And then when he, like when he was kicked out, when he was discarded by his family for this central fact of his, of his being, the very first good experience he had was with an exotic animal person. Mm, yeah. And so in his mind, those become inextricably linked where there is like, he now has value again he is welcomed by somebody and it is in this particular environment. And again, these are, you know, he was what, 17 or 18, I think when he was saying that frontal lobe is not fully developed. That was a huge impact on who he would become as a person to have those two things like right, those two life events right on top of each other. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, while there definitely, there, is, there are some bullying stuff and like, as I went through, I made notes all the way through each episode and stuff. So some of it jumps around a little, but um, there was some, there was some clear bullying behavior. There was some really, I hope we're not giving spoiler alerts. Or we should <laughs> give spoiler alerts. Um, having Travis's mom attend the wedding. Oh my gosh. Um, and then showcasing that and then that, that was so calculating and so manipulative right um that it just really it it made it very difficult to have sympathy for him at that time um but again i i almost sort of feel that his is a narcissism that was more nurture than than necessarily nature right so that's my that's my my quick rundown i think on on joe and also the drug abuse which is going to just yeah. pepper all kinds of flavor into into lots. We're, we're going to talk a little bit about the drug abuse in just a little bit, but okay. I, I'm curious because the whole time I was around him, uh, the thing that kept coming to mind is that this guy's a sociopath, and so right. I was wondering, like from your from your professional experience, can you can you explain to me and the audience? What exactly defines somebody who is an actual sociopath? So a sociopath, um, and it depends on who you speak to, there are different schools of thought in, uh, in psychological research. There are different schools of thought as to whether or not psychopathy and sociopathy are interchangeable terms or whether or not they are two different things. I subscribe to the school that they are, um, um, that, you know, all psychopaths are sociopathic, but not all sociopaths are psychopathic. Does that make sense? Yeah. So um, I think there, there, and and what we mean when we say sociopath or even psychopath really is a fundamental lack of a conscience. So mm. everything that they do, anything that will better them, is is worth it. And there is very little um, true care or concern for other people's feelings, for what happens to other people, as long as it doesn't impact them, right? So 
if somebody is a genuine sociopath, if he was a sociopath, he might have felt real pain at certain, you know, at like the loss of Travis or something like that, but only because of what it does to what it takes from him, something right. in his identity that it took or some enjoyment that it took from him. So sociopaths can sometimes exhibit what seem like real emotions, but those are limited only to the things that they really truly care about for their own, their own desires and needs. Everything else, when they display emotion is purely performative. Right. Um, and some are better than others at it, at this sort of mimic behavior. Um, and some are really, really good for almost everybody, but there are just a few humans who really listen to that evolutionary tingle in the back of their brain and say, this person is, is, is not a normal person. And that, if he has strong sociopathic tendencies, that is probably something that somebody like you would be picking up on where there is this kind of like, um, the lizard brain, like, no, nope, don't like, don't like, I don't want to be a part yeah. around this. And that's, that is, um, for some people, that is the response to sociopathy. Right. And that was kind of the thing is like, uh, I'm going to try to not to get into too many details, but, um, mm -hmm. just seeing the, uh, the impact that he had on so many different people's lives yeah, in a negative way of how he, he used them. He wreaked havoc on people's lives. Yeah. And like yeah. absolute manipulation. And that's the thing, like the, um, the, the part that always kind of bothers me about documentaries uh, is that there is a camera and the person, the subject on camera is, a, is fully aware that the camera's there. And that oh, was he one is thing. always aware that a camera's there. That's the other thing about Very him. Very aware. He's always performing. Right. And that's the thing, like, you know, it's hard for me to just from personal experience being around him really believe that those weren't crocodile tears half the time. Yeah, you they know? probably were. Yeah. Yeah. Particularly when actual crocodiles died. Right. Or, I yeah. guess yeah. alligators. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a dang yeah, that was all. Burned alive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, with a towering inferno. Yeah. Well, um, and you can even see him kind of like rehearsing his stuff and like, yeah. you know, kind of like getting in character a little bit. And, um, and so that's, that's who he was, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's interesting. That doesn't surprise me because that is mostly what it seems. The, and the other thing, and this sort of seems to be across the board with them. I was thinking about, so an, another one of the differences between sociopathy and psychopathy, the psychopathy is who we tend to think of with the really like the crazies that are violent, like, right. because they're um, sociopaths often will have much better impulse control than psychopaths. The so psychopaths have, have, a ton of self-aggrandizement. They really think that they are just the shit. They have almost no impulse control. Um, and they do they more often tend to be violent. But another thing that they um, all exhibit um, is, is extremely high risk seeking behavior. Um, and so, you know, one of the examples that's given in, in the textbook is, you know, normal people get super excited by a roller coaster. A psychopath will get, will register no no excitement whatsoever from the thrill of a roller coaster. Oh, yeah. They, and this is not to say that people who skydive are psychopaths, but like they're, <laughs> they're they all need, psychos. <laughs> they're all psychos. No, but they need that much higher risk category. And I think there is something universal across, or at least all the ones that I've seen, um, across these these big cat and exotic animal things. It is it is behavior both in terms of legality like they're risking going to prison um but also just the inherent danger of of interacting with these big cats let me make sure that we're still good here just want to make sure that we are still rolling here doop doop do okay it says we're good. I think we're good. I think we're awesome, but you know, I don't know. I, know. I think we're fantastic. Uh, it's showing the wrong screen on there right now. Okay. All right. Facebook, help us out here. We had a good flow going. I know. All right. 
do, 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 do. Oh, <laughs> okay. So we have a question from Tony Marlowe. Okay. Uh, how is he different with crew off camera versus on camera? Uh, uh, yeah. So I, <laughs> that's a question from me. Um, he was always like kind of what we were just talking about. He was always just very aware of the cameras being on. Um, you could see him kind of snap in and out of showmanship because like he's a showman like you see his yeah. background and he is absolutely a showman through through all of it so that was very consistent through the whole thing um i want to talk about a little bit um i want to talk about the toxic the toxic masculinity that is pretty consistent throughout the whole thing because for me and like and i'm not even one of those people who you know sees it all over the place um but i think that this is a i know we've had these discussions in the back I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but i think that this is a very appropriate uh scenario to bring that up because you know you know him pulling the gun out and everything talk about i'm gonna kill that carol baskin blah 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 to me that is the most blatant case of toxic masculinity um and i was just curious what your what your thoughts were on that Well, it's definitely a more cartoonish version of it. I mean, I think one of the things that you and I had talked a lot about um, was sort of the the ways to notice that the that the subtle examples of toxic masculinity can be can be bad for the health of both men and and women who are on the receiving end of it. Um, but in the cases that we see on this, like I said, I, I, I see it across the board with everybody that was featured in the show where there is just this, like, it's like testosterone on fire, yeah, even with, with the, with the avowed, like happily gay man mm -hmm. is still this, like, it's, it is again about that risk taking. It's about guns and violence and, um, and for most of those people, it seems, and I don't just say this from the doc because we, um, they touched very, very lightly on Terry Thompson, which was um, the case in Ohio where, where the guy um, of another exotic animal park let all the animals loose and then killed himself. Right. And they didn't really go into that one. That one was, was a more sort of nuanced version of this because he had been involved in years long disputes with his neighbors. He was um, a domestic abuser. And when he, when it looked like he was about to lose the park to his ex-wife as she was, you know, leaving him, he let all the animals out, he killed himself, and then his cats ate him. They didn't go into that in Tiger King. Yeah, that's um, kind of a doozy all the animals, of detail. <laughs> yeah, like all, almost all of the animals had to be destroyed because they were just out on I-70. Like I was still, that was right before I moved away from Ohio. And it was, um, it was bananas. And these poor deputies then have to, you know, shoot and kill these animals, um, which is not easy. Nobody wants to kill a tiger. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. um, so that was a really, like, just really sick version of a lot of this same thing. But these, these exotic animal guys, and honestly, I think Carol too, see these animals as a further representation of the same thing that the guns represent, the same thing that all the, the bravado and the dynamite and all that other shit, it's all part of the same hyped up testosterone stuff. And the, the, the cats are doing that for them too. It is a symbol of power yeah. and wealth and exclusivity um, that they think somehow puts them above other people. Well, and I, that was that was kind of a consistent thing with the animals, uh, kind of being this source of manipulation and power. Yeah, and like it was it was the gateway, and so like that's the kind of the thing that um, I kept feeling through this whole thing is that it's all about power, mm -hmm. and and this you know masculine vibrato was it was yeah. all just it was just a dick waving contest the yes. entire freaking time. Yeah, and that's why they all seem to like each other until one of them becomes a threat. And then, because you notice if you go through the doc, all the, the sort of more side characters that they interview, at some point were saying nice, nice things about other people, like other exotic animal owners, and then the relationship severs. And right. that, because there is always this like, okay, well, now we've gotten a pissing contest and you've won this round and now I hate you. Right. Um, because that, you know, that cuts them down a line. Yeah. 
yeah, it was, it was very frustrating. I will say this, uh, this was, uh, <laughs> it was kind of funny because on Hell in the Heartland, we had security, we had a security detail. We had the most incredible security detail. Like <laughs> they were intimidating. <laughs> They were intimidating. They were heavily armed. We had those cool hot. Well, I had that cool hockey puck. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, I, you, I don't know if you remember that. Like I had basically an alarm thing that I would hit if there was, you know, if like shit really went sideways. Yeah. Um, and these like ex CIA guys would emerge from the shadows and throw us in a van and take off and unfortunately leave all of the crew behind. <laughs> but, right. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> But no, we had we had incredible security for Hell in the Heartland, but and with good reason. There was a yeah. lot of reason not to trust local authorities. Yes. in certain places. Yes, yeah. I was very I was very thankful for those guys, and I yeah, thought of did. them a lot because we did not have security on the the Tiger King set, and uh, it was the only time that I have ever brought like I conceal carry and it's the only time i've ever that thought even went through my mind and i actually did bring a weapon with me just once whenever we were around tim stark who uh oh interesting yeah because he was with the, the funny thing was i never felt threatened by jeff Lowe. i always thought he was just big tough guy yeah. but full of crap yeah but tim stark actually scared me He's yeah, no, I can see that. There is a much more low, low rolling boil with him um, than than with with uh, Jeff Lowe. Now, I will say Joe's firearms handling was absolutely terrifying. Like the way, like just waving the gun around, pointing oh, yeah. it at people. Travis pointing guns at people. I'm just like, oh the my god, all the time. how is somebody not accident? Yes. Yes, just terrible. Um, so I would be concerned for the safety just just for that simple fact that they clearly don't even know how to use guns. But right, um, yeah, that's interesting. I guess I wouldn't mind more knowing more. I guess about about Tim. Yeah, Tim was. Uh, he just would run his. He just he would talk about killing anybody. Like he was just you know. And that, it, it, again, it kind of goes back to that toxic the toxic masculinity aspect of all these guys. But he was. Like Joe was a loose cannon. He would say whatever it was on his mind. Yeah. Tim Stark was that times 10. <clears throat> Except that he didn't want to run for president. <laughs> so, yeah. Like, in, in running for, for high office as well. This is another um, very high concentration of narcissism in, in even in sort of lower levels. Like it's not always malignant narcissism but there you have to be pretty full of yourself to think yeah i could do that oh <laughs> you know? yeah well and that's the thing like um i don't i i don't know if it was for a publicity stunt or if he genuinely thought i think here's here's what i think about that i think that he had certain things that he wanted to bring to the public's attention like marijuana rights and you know gun rights and animal rights and that kind of thing and he used that he wasn't stupid right i get that yeah so, like i don't know it's just kind of like he i i see the ma the method behind the madness but at the end of the day it became part of his ego yeah yeah and it's funny i think when he transitioned from presidential candidate to governorship yeah uh, yeah I, I no, I mean, I think that w he actually probably had a real shot at, you know, I mean, like the presidential thing is ridiculous. People spent a bill, literally a billion dollars. Like yeah. nobody, nobody is ever going to, going to make it up like, you know, from that level, but governor's office is a different kind of race. If you can get enough people to donate behind you, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, well, and I, I, I thought he had I feel a like good, there's some clarity that should be made about him winning 19% of the vote. He won 19% of the, the uh, gubernatorial vote, which was yeah. like choosing the candidate <laughs> for that party. So, oh, it was just the primary. Right, yeah. So like within the oh, primary okay. of like all the independent, it was like him versus like, I think two other guys. And uh, it was really interesting because like I was there with him at the, the, the watch party. His oh, little, wow. His uh, gubernatorial race. And like, he didn't care. Okay, like, that's interesting. Yeah, hey, look at that. We lost. Oh well. Yeah. 
We got a question from Hannah Marchant. Uh, oh, Hannah! Hey, yeah! <laughs> I forgot you guys know each other. Of course! <laughs> Uh, do you think Joe is ever under the influence of meth while the film crew is around? Yeah. Um, I honestly don't think so. I think, well, we know, we know the behavior of meth yeah. pretty well um, because on Hell in the Heartland, there was a whole lot of meth all over the place. <laughs> I, I don't think he was never erratic. Not, not with cast and crew, let's be clear about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We knew meth a lot. Woo! A lot. Woo! How is he going to get through that, now. man? No. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, uh, Sarah, did you feel like he was under the influence at all during any of that? No, I mean, it didn't seem like he was somebody who was, because if you were enough of a meth head or meth addict that you were going to be using while filming a documentary, yeah. you would also be exhibiting a lot of other really far gone signs, right? And he certainly, he looks like somebody who is maybe dabbled, but he doesn't have that, he doesn't have that meth look. Yeah, um, and then that John Finley look. Yeah, <sighs> yeah. No, and I, I think he is. He was far too functioning to right. You know, to, like I think that he was into uh, weed and say he weed. personally would deny that he ever did any drugs whatsoever. Oh no, he but, said it in the thing. He said he had done coke and he had done meth and he had, he sort of sort of like laughed it off like he had dabbled. He said it just right. in passing in one yeah. one scene. Well, it was interesting because, like, on the crew, he would, like, he would mm. do stuff that he literally just said. I got you with you guys. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, oh, Jesus. Yeah, man, I'll tell you, if you could be high on meth while holding down a zoo like that, like, good Lord. <laughs> yeah. You should run for president. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you are multitasking like a pro. Man. Yeah, <laughs> no kidding. Um, let's talk a little bit about Carol Baskin. Yeah. Okay, so prognosis, what do you think? Um, I think that she is 100% exactly like the rest of them. Yeah. Um, I don't think that she is um, this altruistic, um, she is only there for the good of the cats. Mm. Um, she, you know, I mean, she exhibits so many of the same things that she is criticizing others for. I mean, in, in, there was a, a scene in Tiger King where she's talking about, I don't even understand how Doc Antle gets these girls to just come work for him for free. And then literally they cut to the next scene and she's talking about almost a hundred volunteers that work for her for years in yep. and years out. And she even, she says, I don't, I'm not paying them. I don't need to pay them. Like yeah. it, it just. These freaking animals are, I mean, they the, are. Incredible. They are the draw. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think, you know, this, she's got this, she's got a persecution complex, which is also common in, in narcissism. Yeah. Um, you know, everybody's out to get her. And obviously in this case, there's some truth to that. Um, although I don't, I sort of just, at least based on what's in the documentary, I find it unlikely that she was ever in any real physical danger. Um, yeah. I, I, I really, I really just don't think that, but you know, it seemed to me, especially on the second watching, that she, and I also have a little, um, a little birdie involved in another production that I can't say, it's nothing to do with me or anything, but uh, a, just a friend who is involved in another production that had some communication with her, um, and some of the insight that I got from conversations about that, and she is so laser focused on the one issue that separates her from all the other parks. Mm -hmm. And that is this whole thing about touching the cats, right? Like she's so focused on that, that what she has done is built her entire belief system around the idea that that somehow makes her park different, that that makes right. hers a sanctuary. Whereas this, and it's like, yeah, it probably is different. Um, but it's not different enough that anybody from the outside, you know, and I'm sure that that bill she's been trying to push in Congress would not close her park. It would close the others. Oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. You know, and, and there is a need for these wild cat or these big cat sanctuaries. Um, I'm just not sure that any of them should be run by anybody other than actual zoological society, like experts, yeah. like more like a Jack Hanna than, than one of these. Yeah, people. for sure. And, and, 
we're going to talk about kind of the, the missed message that I think a lot of viewers uh, just kind of forgot about, but, but yeah. Oh, my I, own son was devastated when he found out because he's a, we joke, my 15 year old son is the crazy old cat lady. Like he is obsessed <laughs> with cats, big cats, little cats, house cats. Um, and I was watching, I was watching and he came down and was like, oh, what's this? Whatever, because he's excited about the cats. And I said something and he's like, oh, he's like the best videos. And he just starts talking about the big cat rescue videos. And I was like, babe, this is, this is them. Yeah. And he's like, no, 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 they're not, they're not like these other, and I was like, oh, but, and I felt so bad, like, it broke my own kid's heart. I was just like, they're really, it's really amazing. Different. It's really kind of a, a testament to the power of perception um, and the power of the, the camera. Like, yeah. Like, just the way that you, when you have control over it, you can portray yourself however you want. Yeah. Like, you can, I mean, we see that in the filmmaking world all the time. Like you get the correct angles and make it look like it's a bigger crowd and, you know, yeah. it looks like it's much more grand. And so it, it really is a testament to, she got to hand it to her. She knows how to work oh, that she's, camera. Yeah. And she jumped on the, the social media train um, early. She was smart to get on them. I mean, she's definitely, I think she's probably the smartest of them. Um, mm -hmm. She, I mean, Antle seems smart too, but in a really deeply unpleasant way. So. Right. Yeah. Um, let's touch a little bit about on the, the victim mentality, because I think that's yeah. something that's very unique to Carol. Uh, and it's something that I, I, it's very interesting to me how um, when you see people like Carol and this victim mentality is placed in there, and even Joe, quite. I, oh, I absolutely. Like they all have it, actually. If you watch them, each of them. Yeah. make some sort of comment that you're like, that they're clearly think everybody is out to get them. Everybody either wants to be them or is out to get them. Yeah. And it's like, and it, and it seems like it justifies things in their minds that, you know, I'm sure that Joe felt 100% justified in hiring a hitman to kill Carol, which by the way, yeah. he wanted her dead. Like, <laughs> I think he probably wanted her dead, but I don't think he, I mean, I don't think he had the, the means or the resources to get it done or to probably go through with it. Yeah. If somebody had handed him a hundred grand and a mob guy, I don't know if he'd have been able to go through with it. I don't know, man. Cause I, but you, I mean, again, no, I'm not know. getting a personal sense. Everything that I am, all of my impression is through is through a lens whereas yours like you stood next to him and mic'd him and, <laughs> yeah. you know yeah I, I trust your judgment on that honestly i'm a little torn on it because like you know on one hand i felt like everybody was full of shit so yeah. like i didn't believe that they would follow through but then on the other hand you know because of the two-sidedness of joe of how he was one way when he knew somebody was looking and how he was a completely right. different way whenever somebody, I feel like if somebody is going to be ripe to do something truly malicious, it would be somebody like him. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's absolutely possible. I just, I, I, I think, you know, this, the story she told about being at the gas station and feeling, you know, and waking up and almost shooting the neighbor's dog. And I, was, I just feel like it's all a crock. Oh yeah. No, <laughs> I don't I, think she was ever really in any I danger believe much that carol said at all yeah which we have a question from hannah marchant uh do you think that carol killed her precious husband i think it's entirely possible i think she is i think that um it, it that narcissism and sociopathy are very dangerous when they are challenged or when an obstacle is placed in front of them. Right. If you place an obstacle in front of a narcissist, if it means killing somebody, they will. And if it's true, and again, this is one of these things where it's like, well, in a doc, are we getting all of the information? But if she really did believe that he was about to leave her and take all the money and take the cats and everything like that, um, I think she would probably have been capable of it. I don't know enough about the case. Yeah. To and I, what, like what the actual, um, just the the nuts and bolts of the investigation. Yeah. Would be. I do think 
I think it wasn't a great job. It certainly isn't a serial killer, like because the van being left at the airport and everything like that, that's just stupid. Right. Because flights are trackable. Why would you why would you put the van someplace that would then set the police up to disprove that value? <laughs> yeah. Well, there was just a lot of no flight left out of there for Costa Rica, you yeah. know, then he didn't get on a plane there. That's it. It's easy, you know. And I can't help but think I unfortunately have been seeing a, a recurring theme in, you know, in our time on Hell in the Heartland in the Innocent Man documentary that was shot out in Ada, Oklahoma. Yeah. And then in this of like our law enforcement just kind of stops looking <laughs> like. Um, for missing adults. Yeah. Like what, what the crap? <laughs> I think. You know, the only thing I'll say about that, like, of course, I'm a big believer. I mean, and, and we were talking about this before we went on. I'm a big believer that every single case should be explored to the, you know, the fullest capabilities of everybody yeah. involved. There is also the very real, like, boots on the ground fact that crime happens every day, mm. right? And so even in, like, Hillsborough County, in, you know, which is Tampa, Greater Tampa, where he went missing, which is going to be big, right? Yeah. There's still, there are murders happening. There are children going missing. And so even, a, you know, a detective with the best of intentions is going to get pulled away from mm -hmm. a potentially voluntarily missing adult pretty quickly and tasked with other things. Yeah. Um, you know, is that ideal? Is that, is that great? No. And there, and it sounds like maybe there were some, some really just like rudimentary mistakes made at the beginning. Um, and that I feel like there's never an excuse for. Right. But in terms of the reason that people stop devoting resources to missing adults um, after a fairly short window of time is just the reality of there not being enough investigators to keep looking and handling all the new shit that's coming in every yeah. day. It really is so, that's so fascinating. And I think like with, the the case of like the innocent man i don't know if you saw that documentary on net on netflix but. i'm i'm like one episode in and then i got pulled away and then honestly i kind of forgot about it so i need to go back and and you need to go back and watch back. it it's one yeah of those things like i i've kind of noticed where it kind of felt like we had a similar situation with the 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 um the bible case mm. like the public just wants somebody yes and and it almost doesn't matter who, does it? Yeah. And yeah. it's very frustrating. <laughs> very, very frustrating. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Do we have any questions? Do you think? Oh, oh, okay. Um, perfect segue, Tony Marlowe. We have a question from Tony Marlowe. Do you think Doc is considered a narcissist? He is the most clear example, in my opinion, of a probably born hardwired narcissist um sociopath in the show yeah. yeah so what makes him different from from the other two he is much more calculating he is much more practiced now it also sounds like he has you know perhaps he hasn't had some of the same adversity in life that joe and even carol if you you know listen to the early stories of her life and everything there was a lot to kind of overcome and so some of that that nature and nurture stuff gets layered on um I don't know anything about his beginnings. He didn't really talk about it that much, but it seems like from a very young age, he was involved in this world. You know what I mean? He was dealing in, in illegal exotic animals. Um, it looks like from the eighties with that other guy, the one down in South Florida, when they were showing the pictures and stuff, um, the way, I, I mean, the level of self aggrandizing bullshit. <laughs> is yeah. Stunning. You, yeah. You are not a doctor of anything. If you go on his uh, Instagram page right now, under it says his name, and then it says underneath the only a single word description is scientist, which is just infuriating because he's a doctor of mystical science, such garbage. Um, he renames himself literally Lord. He makes people call him Lord. He, one of the worst things that he does is that he renames the women, right? So we see with domestic abusers, um, and serial domestic abusers that the, the, the first step in the pattern is to isolate the, the victim and make them wow. dependent on you. And he does this, I mean, to some degree willingly, but he takes them at very young, impressionable ages. Um, so 
clearly he's got um, uh, proclivities towards younger, towards younger uh, not quite yeah. legal. Yeah. Um, and then by renaming them, he is creating a new identity, which is, is, is attached exclusively to him, not to their own families. And so there's just all these indicators. And the, the one thing that was the most, that was actually the most upsetting for me in watching it was the woman that they're interviewing in Iowa, the one who was with him for like nine years and then right. is not, you know, there anymore. When she is discussing her time, if you watch her body language, I would, I would be surprised to learn if she had not felt sexually traumatized by him or sexually abused. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. And like it, yeah, it's very, and that to me made, you know, made me so angry. And then all this bullshit about doc and everything that I just, I, I yeah. couldn't, I couldn't almost see past the red. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We've got a question from Nicole Missick who asks, uh, I want to know what Sarah thinks about the emotional state of doc's wives. Uh, they all seem so normal. What would you draw? What would draw them to him? Well, they, I mean, I don't know because all we see is what's in front of the camera. Mm. And these are, I mean, again, if you think about domestic violence and domestic um, abuse and coercive control, um, oftentimes you don't have any idea on the outside what's going on on the inside. And I'm not even necessarily saying that he's physically abusive, although I, I also would not be I wouldn't even be shocked. a little bit surprised. Yeah, no, not, I wouldn't even be a little bit surprised. Um, but there is, uh, they are just performing kind of like everybody else. This is literally what they do 16 hours a day is deal with these animals and perform for crowds and his approval, um, their, their, their safety and their health and their just sort of general peace of mind is completely dependent on his approval. Mm -hmm. So of course they're going to seem normal and healthy and happy. And that's why I think it was actually really good that they interviewed somebody who did not feel attached to that anymore. Yeah, I'd be really curious to find out the circumstances under which um, that woman in Iowa left. Um, but they also, you know, they, they may believe that they are very happy. They may be happy. They, you know, they got there at a young age and the ones that are elevated, he has, he has obviously given them big, beautiful homes. Like he drove by each of the, the houses of the three wives and he was like, look, this is where this one lives. This is where this one lives. So, you know, to some degree, they're living a, a, a pretty good life. And if they're happy with it, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't kink shame a relationship, shame anybody you do. You, <laughs> sure. As long as everybody is where they want to be. Right. Yeah. I think that there was, um, it, it felt like there seemed to be somewhat of a consistency between the way that Doc treated his gals and the way that Jeff Lowe treated his wife. Yes, and also though in the way that Joe treated Travis and and um, yeah uh, and the and and John, uh, John Finley, yeah, Finley, yeah. So um, it's it, it's really just like you could almost do a doc just about Joe and and Antle. Mm -hmm. Because they are really very similar, just one is a little more polished. Right. That's re I, you know what I mean. Like, and we saw the mess versus behind disorganized. The scenes. Right. We saw the mess behind the scenes with Joe because he is incapable of keeping everything together, and that's why when I say the difference between a sociopath and like somebody with like just terrible impulse control, you know, Antle's done a very good job of making everything look shiny on the outside. And wasn't it interesting, again, the woman in Iowa talking about the cockroaches that the, that the lesser women lived with, you know, like the terrible conditions that they lived in. Yeah. Um, so as long as everything looks fancy, he's perfectly happy. Whereas Joe's just like, eh, what you see is what you get. You yeah. Know? What is, I mean, like, because you have an extensive, you know, line of experience when it comes to like domestic violence and and, you know, predatory people what is it that um what are uh, what would you say this is kind of a, a weird sidebar but i feel like it's important for i don't know just for the universe just for my own yeah. peace of mind like wh what is something that we can say to young women that find themselves in situations where they're being manipulated uh to that degree 
oh my god i mean that's a whole nother show i just did a yeah. show about this um it's it's such a fine line and it's so case dependent because it matter it it makes a difference when you are intervening when you are seeing the red flags that you're trying to present to them i think i mean the biggest thing i would say is to present yourself if you if somebody you know particularly a young woman you know which is often when these relationships begin uh, there's a lot of sort of um intimate partner violence going on in like high school and college age kids mm, right yeah. so if you are somebody who sees that and are trying to get through to somebody i mean simply saying i can't watch you do this i'm walking away is is not going to do anybody any good and the best thing you can do is present the red flags calmly rationally and you know maybe continue to present them delicately but always make it clear that you are 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 open to receiving the information back and that that it is a safe zone to discuss this stuff right yeah. so if you're going if if somebody if you're if a friend is dating some guy and he's exhibiting these behaviors he's starting to isolate her or he you know is is you know abusive in 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 discussing you know like name calling and stuff like that you don't just say oh he's a piece of trash and i hate him you have to say like this scares me for you because of this this or this and really kind of make it about about the victim um because then she will be less embarrassed or less protective of him if she needs to present the information to you at another time if she's got questions and i i keep saying she it's about an 80 20 split right, so it is yeah. much more often she but not exclusively um well we see that with travis and john finley of of like it like it was interesting to see that like this kind of manipulation and stuff does happen to men too. And, um, yeah. you know, it's just as tragic. So. Oh, absolutely. And it's the same, you know, whether it's, whether it's, um, a heterosexual, you know, female abusing a male or male on male, by like, it's all despicable. There's not, mm -hmm. there's just, there's no call for it. There's no reason to tolerate it. And if you are in it and you want out, there are resources. Yeah. Um, but it's also important not to judge anybody because you don't know, they, they often know if you, if somebody, you know, is really in the throes of it, they know better than you what's safe for them. Right. And, mm -hmm. and we know that statistically just prior to, or just after leaving an abusive partner is the most dangerous time. Sure. Um, wow. yeah, but you know, so we, you know, we often like, Oh, why didn't she just leave? Well, it's really, it's a lot more. Uh, well, it's kind of like, I, it kind of reminds me of like uh, addiction and like the reason why it's so hard for people to, to, to quit their addiction is not so much because they like the substance so much, right. because they're terrified of the withdrawals. And that's kind of a similar scenario, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. So. There's just so much more going on behind the scenes that, that we yeah. don't know. And so the best thing you can do is be open and receptive and non-judgmental to, to, to it as best as you can. And that can be hard. And sometimes maybe if somebody you're witnessing you know, go through this is someone that you love um, and they're not kind of hearing reason yet or they're not responding to it yet, find somebody else to complain to about it. Yeah, Don't complain sure. to them about it. Yeah. Um, and, the, you know, the other thing, actually, since we're on that, <laughs> um, I, I did find really interesting when you, we were saying that, um, that Jeff was a lot of bluster and obviously he is a horrid individual. Oh, with man. All this, like getting her back to tell you. That was the most scummy guy I've Ugh. ever encountered in my life. And I've, I've met some pretty freaking yeah. scummy guy. I've been doing this job for 10 years, and that guy by a long shot was the most scummy guy. Well, and I said this when we were working on Hell in the Heartland. You, I definitely believe you have good instincts. That's why I say if you say that somebody <laughs> is exhibiting sociopathic traits, I think that they probably are. Um, the thing that flashed up on the screen when they were talking about Jeff Lowe's background and they flashed up on one of his domestic violence um, arrest charges. Yeah. And it specifically um, notated strangulation. Right. And the single biggest indicator that a domestic abuser will end in, it will kill a victim is a history of strangulation in the relationship. Oh my gosh. Yeah, he's uh, he was a uh, he was a bad dude. He's he was, bad dude. Yeah, he was a very he was so manipulative 
Um, yeah. Joe was manipulative in a chaotic way. Yeah. Jeff was a very manipulative person in a very uh, cold, very cold and calculated way. Yeah. Like you could tell that this guy just has a massive history of being a con artist. Yeah. 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 Obviously. I mean. And uh, just his like the way that he treated his wife uh who they have now had a baby which by the way he denies that it's his um and uh, see that's the thing like honestly there's so much that we didn't touch on on this in the series that i wouldn't be shocked if we used a lot of the footage that we got for season two and i'm not 75 percent sure we're going to get a second season oh no kidding oh <laughs> you heard, heard it here first guys yeah, that's right so there's a lot more to the story and a lot of it, I wow. think, you know, if, if, and when there is a season two, it's really going to focus on Jeff Lowe. Cause he, uh, I mean, like, I definitely think that he pushed Joe. I think that Joe is guilty as sin. I think that he should absolutely be in jail, not just for the murder for hire, but for, you know, for the animal stuff, yeah. all the different stuff. Like he is not a good guy. Right. Um, but I think that Jeff was definitely the, uh, I think he used our federal system. Puppet master. Yeah. So what were your impressions on all that? On like just the way that the feds got involved and everything? Um, I think, I mean, I think they did a good job with the case. I, I, I mean, again, I, uh, I don't know the details, so I've not like seen the charging documents and seen all the evidence and everything. Um, it seems like they had a mediocre case on the murder for hire and they made it stick. Right. Um, I think on the animal stuff, which is also federal violation and can put you in prison for a very, very long time. Well, I mean, time. like just him shipping. Probably pretty cut and dry. Yeah. Yeah. Just him shipping uh, exotic animals across yeah. state lines. Like that's a federal offense. Yeah. And, and he did that. He was doing that while we were around. Like that was. The You're complicit. No. Whenever he was shipping tigers to his little hidden place up in Bartlesville that were then going to be shipped out. So like. He was so unapologetic about the whole thing. He didn't give a shit about those animals. No, I think, and it's sad because if you see, you know, that footage of him in like his 20s, I think he probably did at one time love them very much, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and then they just became a means to an end as he got more and more desperate moving through life. Yeah. And I think for Jeff, the, the animals are a means for just wealth. Oh, like, absolutely. That's all he I mean, about his money. And he's stabbed his partner in the back the one who like found the the spot down there on the texas border i oh, mean yeah. like it's just he just uses people he gets them what he gets what he needs out of them and then yeah. and then casts them aside yeah last i heard through uh <laughs> in a weird way um thanks to this pandemic uh jeff is so far under as far as financially uh because he's been building that zoo down there that's cost millions of dollars. And like, like I've been there several times during the construction of it. And there were so many setbacks and stuff like he was, he was bleeding money. So at this point, thanks to the pandemic, I'm pretty sure that he's, he's about bled dry. So, well, one can hope. I mean, uh, karma's a bitch. Yeah. Yeah. Schadenfreude is my favorite emotion. <laughs> Um, let's talk a little bit about kind of the, the drug use that we yeah. saw, because again, like you and I have plenty of experience being around, you know, situations of meth and, you know, hardcore drug use and stuff like that. Um, how does, how does drug, in your experience, how do drugs kind of play into the manipulation? It, I mean, with, with addiction, an, an addict in the in really in the throes of addiction can exhibit a lot of the same behaviors that just a natural hardwired narcissist can or sociopath can, which is to simply use every move all the pieces around and by pieces I mean the people in your life to you know achieve your own ends. So um, although I think the difference is again we're talking then about a you know the su the substance is is really the bad guy in that case not the person who is right. is doing what they need to do essentially to survive um whereas with sociopathy you're just a shit bag and there's just, no, yeah <laughs> there's 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 no way around it so and you know it's hard to tell i mean it was sad seeing like 
Finley and 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 Travis and these other people who were clearly um, battling addiction, like while it looked like at least while the shooting was going on. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I I, I think that um, John Finley was he was probably high while we were shooting him because I was on the interview with him during the, his shirtless interview. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> where did you mic him? I, it's just a boom. I only all I had was a boom because I was like I brought that to their attention. I'm like, what am I? What are you? <laughs> like, what am I gonna do? Clip it to his nipple rig? <laughs> oh, you totally should have. Oh I my god! Done that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's just a boom on there, and uh, it's funny. A little, I'll, I'll give a little funny behind the scenes thing. Like during his, his interview, at the very beginning, you see there's a little fire behind him. Oh. I lit that fire. I set that fire. <laughs> it took me forever because it was raining outside, and they insisted on having this freaking fire in the shot. And I was like, dude, our interviews go for like three hours. Yeah. The fire's not going to keep that long. He's like, no, I don't care. It's going to look great. Oh, my God. <laughs> so That's amazing. So you see at the very beginning, it's just kind I of felt like bad, sad... man. His teeth got worse and worse over oh. the course of the film. He, um, bless his yeah. heart. He, uh, I couldn't help but just feel sorry for him. Um, yeah. Because like. The, just the uh there was a recurring thing with with him and uh and you saw with Dylan and you know and um and with Travis or I'm sorry you saw with Travis and John Finley of like they were denying their homosexuality the entire time and like it was it was it was the weirdest thing being in those interviews and being like I'm not gay wait but you <laughs> you have yeah. Joe's name tattooed on your crotch. Yeah, it's, I mean, in that, it, the, the fact is they might not be in strict orientation terms. Do you right. know what I mean? Like, and honestly, nobody can really say that except for them, but, but sure. who, who's to say if now they're trying to kind of make a different life and so they feel like this is what they need to say now i don't know um yeah. my theory is that they live in backwoods oklahoma where being gay yeah. is not exactly universally accepted so like they're trying to you know you know make ex you know they, find they, any way they're trying, yeah. to deny it. they're trying to stay closeted that's yeah. my theory um, well and that also is w often why you'll see addiction is that it's a you know the 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 substance has become an escape mechanism for the pain of not being able to be who you are or not be accepted for who you are in your in your environment yeah. um i mean that's that's in so many situations that's the probably the saddest part of the whole thing is that people end up you know with addictions that they didn't need to have if the if the people in their lives just said I love you. I don't give a shit. You know, I mean, it's, yeah. I know that I'm oversimplifying, but that is sort of the, you know, what it comes down to that there's so much addiction that is a function of escapism. Right. Oh, for sure. And it's, I think it's, in my experience, I feel like the addicts that I've encountered have been either they are trying to escape because of self loathing or they are trying to escape because of the sense of narcissism that they deserve this. That they deserve yeah. to feel yeah. this way. And uh, yeah. I think with John and with, um, I never met uh, uh, Dylan. Dylan. Or I met Dylan because Dylan came later on down the line. Uh, Travis. I never met Travis because Travis was our. Oh. Um, oh. We got a question from Tony Marlowe. She asked, What are your thoughts on uh, Travis's suicide? I mean, it's fucking terrible it's terrible it's terrible i mean yeah. i can say i'll, I'll he was quickly, he had you know? he, he probably had some some significant depression before he got there and and you know joe lavishing toys and fun and excitement on him gave him a temporary respite from it but he needed real support not just trucks and guns yeah because well, that's also, just a band-aid yeah for sure i i will say that it seemed to be the consensus on uh on the zoo grounds like with everybody that it wasn't necessarily a suicide it was an accidental suicide 
Dylan or all of those guys love their guns, but like you said, Sarah, they had no idea how to how to operate them or how to yeah no concept of gun safety. Basic things like keep your freaking finger off the trigger until you're ready. Don't to point it at your own brain. Don't point um, it at your own head. And so, yeah. like, I my thought the only okay, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, like, uh, not to sound harsh, but uh, I don't think it was a suicide so much as a Darwin Award. Like, I know that's right, an terrible. accidental. Yeah. yeah. the The only thing I will say to that is that we do find, and this is one of the things I learned in like my first academy, is that um, almost always the family um, or loved ones of of uh, people who die by suicide um, deny that it was truly suicide, right? Mm, so you'll see a, a lot of of if they if nobody was present, then the family almost always believes there was foul play, mm -hmm. and if somebody was present, then the family believes that it was accidental. Right. And like one of the few exceptions to that is autoerotic self asphyxiation, and when that happens, and there is an inadvertent suicide the families will then often say well he had significant depression or you know what i mean so it is the only time yeah. that suicide is embraced by a majority of of like supports of like loved ones of, of a victim um people it's a very very hard thing for the human brain to wrap around itself yeah um, that somebody that's really you love that's an interesting point yeah and it's it, it's something i would not have necessarily known if i didn't if i didn't learn that before i went into law enforcement and then you know like as i'm on the ground seeing it like oh yeah there it is it's yeah you know it's very very tough for people to acknowledge that somebody um died by suicide wow that's really fascinating that's really interesting we've got a question from brett carr what drew dylan to joe he seems normal sober good situation uh i, I guess i can answer that question um i think that dylan uh, I think he was, I think it was another case of him being young and impressionable and Joe having all these tigers and things. Um, I think it was more of a manipulation on the side of Joe. That's just, there's a reason that he chooses men the age that he does yeah. that are literally just barely legal. Um, because it's, it's much easier to, um, to mold them. Right. Yeah. So I think that's the, I think that's what was going on with Dylan. I think there was also, I think Dylan also, you know, wasn't necessarily there for Joe, you know, because like whenever he got convicted, we were there and we called Dylan and, and explained to him that it was going to be 22 years in jail and he didn't seem to give a shit. Was he even at the courtroom? No, nope. He was not. He got the news from the documentary crew. Was he local? Yeah. Like, could he have been in the courtroom? Yeah, he could have been there. So I don't think that at the end of the day, I think that he wanted Joe's stuff, you know. So yeah. it's, that's the sad thing about this. That's whole a, there's thing. a lot of sad. Yeah, there's just that's, a lot of sad. And that's why, like, you know, you can ask my wife, like, I would come home from shooting and I would just be in this funk. Like, it's, it's kind of interesting that um, people are finding the humor. And, you know, and that's fine. That's fine to find the humor and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's a color. I think it's, a, it's a, an important way to do documentary, actually. It makes people, it's a lot easier to get through seven episodes if you don't feel like, you know, slashing your own wrists at the end of it. Like, yeah, for sure. it's, I think that humor, even in crime documentary, is really important as long as it's always tactful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I you think know? that they did. A, I was really honestly super impressed with how they brought it all together and how they made it all work. I think, yeah, I, I think it's great. Shooting for like five freaking years. And I was like, how are they going to, what is this? How are they going to film this? This is going to be nine seasons. <laughs> yeah. So I thought they did a fantastic job. Um, I, uh, I, I appreciate that people can find the humor in it and you should, but, uh, at the end of the day, I think it's, I think that uh, there was a lot of missed messages from this whole thing that I kind of want to talk about a little bit. And the first thing is the animals. Um, you know, 
yeah, Joe is a, he's a very colorful character. He's a very, you know, he's a performer. And so yeah. he understands how to play a crowd and that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, he was a serial animal abuser. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe that he gave a single crap about the animals at the end of it all. Um, and, and that's kind of the case with all of these folks. Like you have yeah. hundreds of animals, hundreds of beautiful hundreds. Yeah. animals that, you know, they're in captivity. They can't be released out into the wild. And I don't know what's going to happen down at the Winnie Wood Zoo. I, I like, you know, there, there's the chance that they'll get all shipped down to the new zoo, but like that's not looking likely to be open anytime soon. So there's a very likely chance that these animals will starve. Oh, God. And I think that like that's, that's important to keep in mind. Like, you know, I'm seeing all these, uh, you know, all these, you know, free Joe Exotic and all this kind of stuff. And like, all I can think of is like, did you not, did you not pay attention to the last 10 seconds of the documentary? Right. So I just think that's really yeah, I, for our- I, Yeah, I think you're totally right. And I, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know what the answer is there because I don't know how many more of them are much better. I mean, that's what we were talking about, you know, from the beginning mm -hmm. is these guys are all assholes. Like who is, you know, is it a, a case of, of the lesser of two evils? Are they probably better off, you know, at Carol's, or Antle's, probably, but, you know, we all saw, I looked up, Antle got raided in December, they, they allude to that, the documentary, and I looked that up, and it, and it looks like it was about euthanasia, it was about killing, like, that was why yeah. the state went in and raided, because he was illegally killing, or that was the, uh, the charge, anyway. Right. Um, so, you know, I don't know. Yeah. And at the same time, you know, some, the, one of the guys, was it, was it Tim? One of them that pointed out that there are more tigers in captivity than there are in the wild. Um, and there is this sad fact that like, if they all die off in the wild, well, at least they're not actually extinct. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was a, it was an interesting, I, I will say that like, if you strip, Joe, Doc, and Carol away, and you're left with the lower players. I think those guys genuinely cared about the animals. Um, I can't remember the name of the gentleman with the long hair. Um, yeah. But he genuinely cared about the animals. Like, we, I, I worked with him, you know, on a, several days. And, uh, like, he was super worried about what was going to happen to these tigers. And, like, you know, right. a lot of these tigers he helped – he, he's been with them since they were cubs. So. Right. You know, the other thing too, that I, I, the least objectionable of all of them that I thought was the guy who had done time in Miami for like maybe being the basis of Scarface. <laughs> yeah. Because right. honestly, he's, because he's the only one that keeps them behind closed doors. He's not making money off of them, or at least as far as like what we were shown. He doesn't have, this is not for the public to come and pat him on the back and throw money at him. He, you know, he's just keeping them, like at least on some level, he loves them. I'm sh not sure putting preemie clothes on chimps is great for them, but, you know, he, he seems the least objectionable of the crew. Yeah, I wish, um, I, I wish we would have learned, because it's, that was the one weird thing. It's like we touched on that guy and then we never saw him again. <laughs> yeah. We never know what happened to Scarface. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, like, that's a cool dude. Let's make a yeah. series of fun. What happened to that guy? <laughs> <laughs> Forget about Joe. Go back to Scarface. Yeah, seriously. Man. So, uh, this, it's final question time. I, man, this actually okay. went by so fast, but we've, we're already an hour and a half in, and, and yeah, I know, I, I don't know about you, but I need to go to the bathroom soon. Uh, so we have a question from Brett Carr. Do you think in Joe's mind if this documentary was going to be his Steve Avery moment? Um, I, oh, that's I a great question. That, I don't think that Joe, first of all, Joe didn't know that he was going to be going to jail whenever we first started. <laughs> uh, so I don't think that he had the thought in his mind that he was going to use this to get, you know, pardoned. Um, I think that he was just desperate for fame. 
he was desperate for fame. He, he, he held on to this concept of fame uh, in a way that I've never seen before, uh, in a way that was absolutely damaging and devastating to everyone around him. He cared more right. about his own fame than he did anything else. And now he's got it. Yeah. And thank God he's behind bars. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is interesting. I mean, that's, there were a couple points. He said something in one of the calls from the jail where he said something about like, you're going to, you're going to be asking why is Joe in jail? These other people should be in jail. And, you know, I, th I'm sure there is a part of him that hopes that there will be something that comes out of this, some sort of legal movement or some, I don't know. I don't think that's probably doesn't look like he got railroaded. Um, you know, I, I think in terms of just wanting fame, I think Carol's again, no better because uh, yeah, absolutely. The, the backlash, she's really now very unhappy there's a lot of public pushback on the doc from her, which the filmmakers have then responded to and said, nope, this is boop, boop, boop. Here's where we were clear about, you know what I mean? Yeah. So again, like one of the problems with narcissism is it can cloud your vision of what you think people think of you. Yeah. And so I think they both went into this, um, all of them, of the, of the main players, went into this believing that it was going to paint them as this badass, you know, big cat tamer, yep. lover of animals. And instead we just sort of see this like exposed, ugly underbelly of a really weird little world. <laughs> really weird. Yeah. Funeral service I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I just remember Wait. whenever Travis put his balls on my face. <laughs> <laughs> I love those balls. <laughs> the part they didn't they didn't capture in the doc was how he would smack his lips so he would say something like that he i loved his balls oh so no. gross as a sound guy i'm hearing him go and it's yeah. like yeah uh, uh, <laughs> i think i they would have to cut that out because of all the like i definitely am a misophonia person yes. like there are sounds that make me want to like light people's uh. faces on fire i would not make it through a doc if there was a nope. lot of that smack 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 no uh, i wouldn't make it let me it. tell you i i've i've worked on several sound times. guy uh, yeah uh my 600 pound life and like oh that is the shortest fuse that i have like having it's, to listen to people eat that's the theme yeah. of the show <laughs> like i'm being paid to listen to the one thing that i cannot stand so now yeah. I'm having lunch with people and they're nom, 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 nom. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, for the listeners, uh, <laughs> do you guys have any more questions for Sarah? And we're going to let that marinate for just a second because I think there's yeah. a little bit of a delay on this. Um, in the meantime, uh, Sarah, where can we find you online? Is Hell in the Heartland available on Amazon or any kind of streaming service? I, you know, I'm not 100% sure. I know that... I think it's available if you have it, it on Hulu, but with certain subscriptions, right? Okay. So that's my one, like that I that I know that it's available. Um, it might be available on Prime now. I'm not sure. If not, you can yell at the HLN people and tell them yeah. um, that you want it. Um, and you can the the easiest way the 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 most professional social media of mine is Twitter, which is just my name backwards. It's just at uh, Kaylin Sarah. Um, and that's where I keep, I tend to keep people posted on stuff like this or like anything yeah. that I'm doing that is for public consumption. Um, appearances on HLN, appearances on podcasts, stuff like that. Um, I, I keep everything up to date on there. So that's the best place to find me. Very cool. And can you give us a little inkling as to the, the doc series that you're working on right now? Um, it will be... I believe the very first of its kind. So the documentary will be embedded with a 26 year old cold case homicide Ooh, wow. investigation from top to finish with the police agency. So I'm investigating with the Mobile County Sheriff's Department. Um, and I like, I have spent the last year on the case and we are ready to both start filming and start interviewing new suspects at the same time. So, oh, so it's cool. it's going to be it's going to be really cool. Um, I think 
we've got a chance to maybe um, bring some some justice for this victim who was discarded 26 years ago in Alabama, and and yeah. maybe she's finally going to have a voice. That's what we're wow, that's, that's what we're going awesome. for. That's but great. it's going to be unique. It's I don't think anybody's ever done this like from embedded with the agency the wow. way we're going to do it. That's so cool. It's, it's so cool. cool. It's cool. I'm excited. I'm excited. Yay. So, well, yeah. Ah, that's so cool. Um, well, I think that's it as far as uh, listener questions go. Awesome. Thank <laughs> you so yeah. much, everybody. Sarah, thank, thank you, you so much for coming on. First of all, thank it's great you. to just get to hang out with you and talk to yeah. you. Like this Likewise. is a nice distraction with from all the global happenings. So I appreciate it. I know, right? <laughs> And uh, if you are listening and you would like to hear more of content just like this, be sure to visit okishowshow.com or visit our online uh, social media at okishowshow. Uh, and then, of course, you can also listen to all of our podcast episodes uh, on iTunes and SoundCloud and all that crap. In the meantime, uh, we'll see you guys. Uh, be sure to listen to the, the latest episode that came out uh, yesterday featuring Lucas Ross. And then we have more people coming up uh, within two weeks. We have the Oklahoma Film and Television Academy. That's going to be, I'm excited about that. So that's pretty much it. Thank you guys for listening. And uh, Sarah, if you hang on the line, I'm going to say my yeah. actual real, for reals goodbyes. Sounds uh, good. A little bit, but that's it All for right. us guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you. Yay. Yay. That was so cool. That was fun. That was fun. The only thing I, I meant to get into was the arson. Because I oh, had some, yeah. I know, I totally forgot, like, till near the end, I looked at this and I was like, I made notes in my crime classification manual for who Ooh. may have been the most likely. I mean, I, I evaluated it from, could Carol have been behind it or did Joe oh. do it? And, so I'm actually, I'm still recording. Oh, okay. So... Well, now I closed out all my notes. Who do you think the, was responsible for the arson? I think Joe was responsible for the arson. I agree. Yeah. I think th there are some things that point to it possibly being, uh, possibly being a female um, revenge arsonist. Like, because there are these different, that's what this lovely book, The Crime yeah. Book, does. It's sort of like um, a Dewey Decimal System for violent crime. <laughs> Um, yeah, according to this. <laughs> That's right. awesome. And so there's all these like subsections and then sub subsections and stuff. And so in arson for revenge versus arson for self gain, um, there are, you know, certain characteristics that you look at and stuff. And there were a couple of flags that were like, oh, this, this has some of the markers of a female revenge arsonist, which would obviously point to Carol. Yeah. But the overwhelming majority of them were the um, the arson for self gain, and the different categories for that include covering up evidence um, that you yeah. don't want exposed. And That's so it seems like there was, around. yeah, there was something on those tapes or on other stuff stored in that building that he was afraid to have go public. So yeah. that's, I mean, I think it was it was him. Well, and that's the thing, like, there's a lot of stuff that we uncovered in, during the documentary shoot that are, honestly, I feel like are a lot more uh, devastating to his legacy, we'll just say. Yeah. Than, than what we saw in the final documentary. But I really, I would be very surprised at this point, especially with the difficulty for networks to produce a new content this year mm -hmm. with everything oh, going no on. Yeah. Um, that they're probably going to, I I would be, I would not be surprised if they end up, you know, pulling, combing through everything else that you guys did and making another season. Yeah. Off of I don't know if it hit. would be like a full seven episodes, but like, I think that we definitely have it. Right. There's certainly like a follow up limited release. Yeah. yeah. Cause there's a lot of loose ends, man. Like the documentary yes. doesn't tie up the stuff with Jeff Lowe. It doesn't really tie up, you know, um, what happens with the new zoo and all that kind of stuff. And like, there's no more stuff that's gone down. So, yeah. And then, you yeah. know, and actually uh, the sheriff's department down where Carol Baskin is just reopened the case. I know. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. I love yeah. working on stuff that reopens cases and gets people. Uh, dude, what is that right? all about? Yeah. yeah. Crazy. 
Um, I'm two for two now. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think they'll be hard pressed to produce much more evidence than they have now, but they can't, I mean, the public outcry would be ridiculous if they did. So yeah. I don't think she's going to ever go sit in jail for it, but, um, you know, she's certainly capable. Yeah. I think that this documentary is not going to do her and her sanctuary any favors. I think. No, I, out of curiosity today, I wanted to see what the cost of admission was and the link where you're supposed to be able to go get tickets. Uh, I got a 404 on. Really? So you can't even get tickets to the sanctuary now. Wow. Yeah. Meanwhile, at the GW Zoo down in Winniewood, where Jeff Lowe's still running the show, they're selling t-shirts that are basically like carol did it like a picture of a tiger with you know don in there like they're totally like jeff Lowe is completely well that, and that's that's the brand though they've always been i mean even like it may be a little bit cleaned up now but it's still just these schlocky you know political condoms like that's yeah. that's just who they are that's true that's true it's on brand <laughs> yeah yeah it's so funny because like they had basically erased the memory of joe exotic right too and now now they're embracing it now again. they're embracing money. it again yeah and he, well, needs, because, he needs that money right now yeah well which is also sad because then you feel for the employees who are going to be work even more like dogs and yeah. you know probably not in safe conditions and yep. i'm sure that place is not osha certified Oh, um, no way. <laughs> well, because half the people that, that work there are ex-felons. Yeah. Like the guy well, who was hired to kill Carol yeah. still works there. Yeah, it's, I don't know. And that was one of the things about Joe that I thought was like, you're not sure if it's a good quality or an extremely manipulative one. This idea of like giving people their very last chance. And right. some of those people really thrived with that. The one like manager, the long haired, like tall, skinny guy, he seemed to thrive there. And that was good for him that that yeah. was his last chance. You know, it's, um, it's That's sad. Even if his motives were not pure, it did seem to offer a little bit of a leg up for for some people you know yeah. yeah it was uh it was just a constant circular manipulation thing like yeah I, what i felt from that was that he would take these uh you know ex-felons they can't really find any work it's very, right. very very difficult for them to be able to find a job so which is a they're vulnerable show anyway yeah. yeah and uh and so he would take them under his wing Right, but then he could work them illegally because yeah. they had no choice. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Dude, whenever I was there, they were still feeding. I have pictures of horse carcasses that were like rotting that they were feeding the tigers. It was, it's just, it's just sad. It's just disgusting and sad. Well, and you know, that's one thing that the show didn't go into, and it might be because viewers just can't embrace it, but that the podcast that came out on Wondery last mm -hmm. year. Oh, they really did. talked about the status or the, the health condition of the tigers, how many of them were just emaciated. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, the show definitely didn't show that. And I know because people like that was part of the thing for I have friends who wouldn't watch Don't Fuck With Cats, that other oh. that it was on, which was really good. But even just the fleeting moments of animal abuse, like split seconds, people can't handle it. They're like, no, nah, I'm not watching any of it. Yeah um so, you know and so i think that's probably why they didn't show i would imagine that's why they chose not to show the tigers that were in worse shape yeah well and that's why i think it's so weird that the takeaway from this has been the, the how funny everything is and not the right animal. so it's just weird yeah well hey i gotta pee like a racehorse <laughs> hey yeah well and i'm up at four to run so i'm gonna Ooh. go to bed now all right um we should do yeah this, this was really cool um let's do this again if you find something else cry me you want to talk about let me know yeah. I'm, I'm i'm sure there's other stuff down there so yeah. i yeah. like it well and i want to talk yeah. more about like all the you know we we i was hoping that we could have touched on um some of the serial killer cases like uh jeremy jones and all them but we just didn't have yeah uh, we well that's what i mean then, if you so. ever wanted 
if you ever want to talk about that stuff, I'm, I'm obviously your gal. Oh, so um, I think I'm going to do you, more of these live stream things with the just kind of as an extra bit of content for while we're in quarantine. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think everybody's trying to come up with with ways to do that now. So um, yeah. yeah, count me in, holler if you need me. As long as I'm, you know, mostly twiddling my thumbs, I'm happy to jump on. Sweet. All awesome. right, girl. Yeah. It's so great yeah. to see you again. You too. All right. Bye. Good. Bye. The Bones Motor. 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 The Bones Motor.